I have to tell you, dear listener, I'm tight. I'm a miser, a skin flint, whatever you want to call it, so I get a bit cross when the kids leave the lights on or have a big dollop of ketchup left on their plate after dinner. But that's one of the reasons that I love electric cars. I can plug in my Nissan Leaf at home and a couple of quid and an overnight electric tariff and it will do 100 miles. It's brilliant. But even I will admit that electric cars, when they're brand new, are quite pricey. But there's some good news. Dacia, who are the masters of miserly motoring, have announced that they are finally going to bring a car which will cost less than £20,000 to the UK. And this isn't it. But don't turn off just yet, because the underneath of this is basically the same as we're going to get at the end of 2024 in the UK. So we're going to drive it here just to see what it's like. In France, there are two versions available, the cheaper Spring Essential 45 and more expensive and slightly posher Spring Extreme 65. They cost around 18 to 20,000 pounds, but over the channel, they still have electric car grants. So they actually pay around 15 grand, which is about the same as something like a base model Kia Picanto with a petrol engine. But the Spring is much, much cheaper to run. We won't get any grants here in Britain, which means it doesn't look nearly as cheap but we're promised it will still be the cheapest proper new electric car you can buy. Dacia tells us it will undercut the new Volkswagen ID2 and Citroen C3 Electric 2. Both of those will be around £21,000. But most people will pay on some sort of finance deal and the spring could cost less than the average petrol bill per month. And access to those special leasing and subscription deals is the main advantage the spring will have over a used electric car, which will be the real rival to this Dacia. Would you choose this car or a year old Volkswagen E-Up or maybe a two year old Corsa Electric? Let us know in the comments. Oh, and you might as well subscribe while you're there. Thank you. Now inside it looks quite modern. There are these copper bits, which might be a little bit copied from Cupra, but hey, it looks nice. Uh, the feel is perhaps a little bit cheap though, as you might expect at this price range. But the technology is actually pretty good. In this 65 Extreme version, it has a reversing camera, it has satellite navigation, it will mirror your phone, it's got air conditioning too, so not bad from that point of view. What I will say is it does feel quite small. I know it's a small car, but even compared to cars like the Volkswagen E-Up, it does feel quite cramped in here and you feel quite high. Also, I don't think there's a way of adjusting the wheel. It feels a bit low to me and it's just not entirely natural not to be able to adjust the driving position to where you want it. There are signs of cost cutting though. The switches feel a bit fragile and the doors shut with a sort of tinny ting which makes it sound like you've left an empty drinks can in the door pocket. Settle yourself inside and it's reasonably spacious though, partly because you're more upright than you would be in a traditional city car. In the back here is where you really notice this is a small car because this is my seat position. I'm only five foot eight and there's not a lot of space there already, but I'm gonna try and get in. <laughs> <coughs> oh, Ryanair's got more space than this. Also, there are only two seat belts, so it can't be a five-seater. But I think you really need to be kind of primary school age to be comfortable in the back here. Also, it's only got a payload of 330 kilograms, this car. So if you had four big blokes or a lot of luggage and some people are on the heavier side, a rugby team maybe, you're going to be getting close to the maximum weight of this car. Now the boot is 290 litres, which is actually quite a lot for this size of car. It's bigger, for example, than a Peugeot E208 boot, but there are some problems with it. This opening is tiny, so you're going to struggle to get a push chair in there, for example. And there's this big lip that goes into the boot there. The back seat doesn't split, so there's no 60-40, so you can either have a load or passengers, but not at the same time. Because the windscreen's tiny, it only needs one wiper. But look at this complicated mechanism. It's fascinating to watch it work. But I better not lean on this bonnet too much, otherwise I'm going to dent it. The numbers in those model names, the 45 and 65, don't actually mean anything about the battery size. They're the engine power. So 45 and 65 horsepower. Now, 65's not too bad. That's about the same as like a one litre Kia Picanto. 45, that's not much at all. I've got electric drills that have more power than that. Should we talk about the 0 to 62 times? 
Well, the 65, that's a reasonably performing car, so it does it in 13.7 seconds, which is respectable, if not particularly fast. The 45, 19.7 seconds. That's about as fast as the Passport queue at Heathrow. To be fair, that's not what this car's all about. It's meant to be a car that goes around town a lot and, and can zip in traffic, and at that, it's fine. And even on these country lanes, I don't get the same sort of feeling that I'm holding up the other traffic like I do in a Citroen Ami, maybe. Having a smaller battery means it's lighter weight, which again makes it more efficient. It's like a virtuous circle. This car weighs 975 kilograms, which is about the same as the Picanto I was talking about before with a petrol engine, but it's also half the weight of a Volkswagen ID3. A lot of that is down to a smaller battery. It's a smudge under 27 kilowatt hours, which is actually more than in my original Nissan Leaf, but around half the size of cars like a Vauxhall Corsa Electric. The range though, is acclaimed at 140 miles, which is more than some rivals like the Honda e and Mazda MX-30, even though they have bigger batteries. That efficiency means you'll be using less electricity too, of course, but you won't be charging particularly quickly. This is a car which is designed to be plugged in at home and topped up slowly overnight. The charging flap is here at the front, which is gonna be handy if you're pulling into a parking space. It's also surprisingly substantial for a car with like cost cutting at its core. Open it up and you've got here the optional fast charging as well, but you have to pay extra to get that DC charging and it's not particularly quick. What this car doesn't have, surprisingly, is regenerative braking. Now that's been on every electric car that I've ever driven, I think but in this case, it doesn't have it. Now, if you lift off the throttle, you do get some braking effect and the motor does go into reverse to give you some energy back, but hit the brake pedal and it doesn't give you the extra that you get with all the other electric cars. Now that's because it's expensive to engineer and this car is all about keeping the cost low. So you have to do without and brake yourself. Oof. On these country lanes, it does bounce around a lot though. In town, it's generally fine, but you do feel you're getting pushed around by bumps. And the steering just feels slightly sticky, like the electric motor can't keep up with the inputs you're giving it. As you might be able to hear, there's quite a lot of road and wind noise as well. And that's again a sign of the cost cutting. So there's less noise insulation. It hasn't got the, the double glazed glass that you get even on things like the Vauxhall Astra these days. So you do hear a lot more. But nipping in around town, you're not going to notice that. This is where the spring comes into its own, urban areas. Mini roundabouts, cars diving out in front of you, passing cyclists. It's got all the power you could want to squeeze into gaps. And the narrow width means it's absolutely in its element. And the turning circle, of course, is tiny because it's a small car. In town, the spring feels perfectly at home. It's as easy to drive as a Dodgem in stop-start traffic and maintains a dignified composure over potholes and speed bumps. I found myself chuckling as I squeezed into spots which SUV drivers had shied away from. Although I did find some of the controls didn't react quite as fast as I expected, and it's easy to catch the power steering and gear selector out if you try and do manoeuvres in a hurry. They sort of take their time to respond, and it might be fractions of a second, but it really isn't what you want if there are people queuing behind you while you're attempting a parallel park. So the Springs attraction isn't all about the price, although hopefully the finance deals will be good enough to keep even old skin flints like me happy. But if you're a young family and you live in town, it's got just about enough space, it's easy to drive, it's fun, it's efficient. It could be a real winner for you. By the time the car arrives in the UK with its next version and its few improvements, hopefully some of the little problems we've got with this car will have gone. So I'd like to see some regen braking for a start to make it even more efficient than it is now. Also, this car's safety kit isn't top class. It got one star in Euro NCAP, and if I had a family, that would concern me. But still, it's a good effort and certainly a welcome addition to the electric car world. Let's just hope those finance packages are good enough. Now, you have to excuse me because otherwise I'll have to pay another 10p on the parking and I've heard there are some free sandwiches.